Hi world, welcome back to another Let's Play video. Uh, we're going to continue on our game that we've been doing. I've changed the title of my video series to now uh, Tutorial for Winter Operations uh, because technically we're now in uh, the winter period of the Eastern Front. Right, We're now fighting in December. We did the December turn. I believe um, I will be uploading soon the January file. And then we have February, which is what you see here. And so we're going to continue on the winter campaign. Uh, I will say it's been okay. Uh, not the most eventful winter campaign, quite frankly. But I think it's been pretty good. And so without further ado, uh, we're going to continue on this campaign. But before I do, uh, let me first use the bathroom. All right, and I am now back. Thank you for your patience. Let us dive in to this turn, February in 1942. And so it's been a few days since I've uploaded a video. And so, you know, life, I wish I could give a bunch of excuses, but I think the simplest one is that I just don't play this game every day. And uh, that said, I still want to be somewhat consistent. So for those of you who have been watching my videos, I'm seeing that there's about like seven or eight of you who are watching the videos on a regular basis. Uh, definitely cool that someone out there in the world is enjoying my content. Um, but also know that as a heads up, I probably won't be uploading every day, but I aim to have at least a few videos a week for you all to enjoy and for me to enjoy, of course. Um, but I can say a few analyses from what I recall the last time I've played the game. I think the Soviets we were trying to be like super organized with the Soviets, try to launch limited offensives with the idea of just being as efficient as possible. Um, I think the German army, however, was able to respond pretty well. We almost saw Soviet breakthrough here east of Orsha. The Soviets chose not to blitz, which in hindsight, they probably could have, and they, they would have wiped out these uh, two understrength uh, German uh, mech and armored corps, mech and panzer corps, if you want. There's only There was only two two German divisions that survive of an original like seven or eight. So it was a pretty hefty Soviet attack by these three Soviet armies, uh, the 11th, the 40th, and the 10th with the 10th Corps in support. Um, but the Germans were able to reinforce with another infantry corps there, 91st Mech Corps. So both sides are relatively evenly matched. Um, and I think um, the overall Operation Barbarossa itself I would say was a pretty hefty cost for the for the Soviets especially. I think I think you know I will say that generally there's there's probably an ounce of German bias in this game. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what caused it, but my impression has been um, you know uh, I think as playing as the Soviets, I probably put up a greater defense, a more aggressive defense as the Soviets than what we saw historically. Uh, with at least um, more Soviet troops being destroyed in summer 1941. But it came at the gain of the German army not being able to take as much territory as they did historically. So historically, I mean, the German army was all the way as far as Rezhev and Vyazma, and they were even pushing on Mosheisk, which is kind of hard to see there, but it is a small town um, on the western approaches to Moscow. The Germans were also making a push towards Kaluga and Tula. So, you know, the, the, uh, the events leading up to the Soviet winter counteroffensive at Moscow was occurring much closer to Moscow. Uh, this time around, the counteroffensive is actually still taking place around Smolensk. So the German army never even took Smolensk, I don't think, during the summer campaign, while historically, I think they were able to take it by like, I believe by like September. Uh, excuse me, by August of 1941. It was a very long battle, the Battle of Smolensk. Um, I'm, I'm still learning about it through uh, David Glantz, a great historian. But from what I've understood, it was like a four-month-long battle. It started in early July. It, it, it took on the whole month of July and August. I don't think it ended until September 1941. So, so more like two and a half, maybe two and a half months or so. Um, but still, I mean, for, for World War II standards, uh, a two and a half month long battle is still pretty long. Um, if you look at most operations in World War II, they usually lasted between several days or several weeks, usually weeks. Um, but, but very rarely do you have a battle that lasted for several months. I think the only other battle that comes to mind right now, the two that come to mind is, is the Battle of Stalingrad, which started in, 
I think it started in November. Or no, actually, you know, it started way earlier. I think it started technically as early as either September or August of 1942. And it went on all the way until February 1943. So it was a super long battle. Uh, the Siege of Leningrad would be another, if you want to count that as an actual battle. And then I think the Normandy campaign, you know, um, the Allied landings occurred in June. I don't think they broke out. Uh, I actually don't know when they broke out, but it took them quite a while before they had enough critical mass in Normandy to break out. It took them several months. So with that said, um, hopefully we can see some of those effects as we keep playing the game. But I just wanted to point out that the German Operation Barbarossa seems to have, you know, I think the German army has probably sustained more or less the same amount of losses as they did historically. But... You know, um, the German army took less ground, but at the same time, the uh, they took less ground, but the, somehow the Soviets ended up suffering heavier losses. I'm, I don't know, and, or maybe the losses were about the same. Again, it's hard to tell when we haven't quantified any of the data. Um, maybe in the future I can do that, but that's only going to happen, folks, when I'm actually able to program this game, because there's a lot of just things to track and I and I don't have I don't have the time I've tried to actually like create an excel sheet and like track all the casualties on a turn by turn basis and what I found was that doing it by hand took way too freaking long so definitely I think it's in in my best interest to still try to get that thing off the ground that that project but it's only going to happen until I get better javascript and um, I don't know when that's going to happen but I hope soon I really hope soon so that's that's what I'm putting out to the universe is is you know let me get better at programming so I can make a programmable version of this game. Obviously, you'd be open source. You know, this is, you know, I'm not going to copyright none of it. No, nothing like that. But I th what I hope to gain from that is that we could have more people playing this game because it is a really great game. I think all war games are actually pretty amazing, um, but they're board games. They're fundamentally board games. And like most board games, you kind of need to know the rules or need to have the rule book like beside you while you play that game in person. I think the one advantage that a lot of software games have is that more often than not, they tend to be a little bit easier to get into. Not all the time. I've tried to get into a game like Hearts of Iron 4. I found that game to be incredibly complex. Um, I haven't bothered learning that game. But I've just found that software games tend to have a slightly easier learning curve, I think. That may be an overgeneralization, but hopefully you know what I'm what I'm getting at. At least there's a larger audience who seem to be more interested in the software games. And I'm literally, quite literally playing a board game in the format of a software. But, you know, as far as the the mechanics and everything, I mean, it's still in, in all sakes and purposes, for all sakes and purposes, a board game in that the rules I'm playing are mostly in my mind. I've, I've pretty much memorized the rules. All that's left is to check on the rule book every now and then just to make sure that I know like what the heck I'm doing. And speaking of which, I probably should open up the rule book while I'm here. Okay. Yeah, there we go. Okay. So uh, with that said, let's just carry on with the actual game turn and let's jump right in. So we are now February. So two, two winter months have already gone by and it hasn't been all that eventful for the Soviets. I mean, we haven't seen the front line change really all that much. Uh, no major counteroffensive in the Ukraine or Ukraine, no major counteroffensive. Uh, we saw a Soviet counteroffensive near uh, Orsha, that was the only notable one, and an attack on Leningrad. So, you know, not too much has changed. And the other bias I wanted to point out was that the Germans did take Murmansk in 1941, and, and that has definitely, I'm starting to feel the effects of losing five production points per month for the Soviet army. Um, it, it may not seem like a lot, but it, it starts to add up. So I, I do think there's, um, we're going to keep playing the game. I'm sure there's going to be more biases as I continue on with this game because, you know, I am human after all, and I am imperfect after all. Um, and so I, I, what I hope to see, though, is the Soviets are able to retake more months sooner rather than later. So we'll see if we can pull that off. But for now, um, the only other thing to point out is North Africa, right? And the British have put a little bit of pressure on the Axis, but, you know, I've very strategically withdrawn the German army, the German and Italian units uh, further west. And I think this is just a really nice defensive position right around Benghazi because you have the terrain advantages and you kind of have the bottlenecking of supplies for the British forces. Um, but the British are bringing up reinforcements. So we'll see if that can change at all. But, but the main point is that the British have been very slow to respond uh, throughout Operation Barbarossa. They haven't really 
done too much to directly support the Soviets. Another thing to point out for the German, um, you know, sort of bias, or at least some advantages the German army had throughout this scenario, was that we did use OKW quite a bit on the Eastern Front. And while although it is, um, it's uh, disrupted, because it's actually operating outside of its kind of natural, uh, you know, front, it's, it's only meant to operate on the Western Front. Um, so even at, even at full strength, even at level three, it can only command four supreme moves, but still it, it has granted the Germans extra supreme moves on the Eastern Front. And I think that helped them um, gain a little bit of, of advantages here and there throughout the campaign. So with that said, let's start the turn. Um, we're going to start the log file. We're beginning now the February log file. So this is going to be 1942-02, 00 for production. We'll start with the Axis production. German production is looking pretty strong. Um, I count 69 on the Eastern Front. On the Western Front, the Germans have, or the Axis, they should say, have 27 production points, while they have another 20 remaining in North Africa, or the Mediterranean Front. Um, so, and by the way, the Mediterranean Front, for those of you who might be wondering, actually doesn't include all of the Mediterranean uh, nations. You would think that it include, would include Italy and the Balkans, you know, Greece, Yugoslavia, you know, all these other nations. Um, but the reality is that the Mediterranean Front um, actually, I think it only um, is actually kind of being broken up by this gray dashed line. So in fact, I even think that Turkey itself may not even be part of the Mediterranean Front. But everything south of that, you know, the Middle East and North Africa is really where the Mediterranean Front rules apply. So they really apply to just like the North African campaign. I don't know why they didn't call it the North African Front. I think that would have been an easier term, but they decided to call it the Mediterranean Front, even though it doesn't actually encompass all of the Mediterranean. And in fact, it encompasses just the lower half of the Mediterranean. So technically, Italy, Yugoslavia, you know, southern France, Spain, those are all part of the Western Front, uh, for any of you who, who, may, who may have been confused on that. So anyways, we're going to start with the, the Axis production here. We have, um, uh, I'm going to roll four dice because I have uh, 20 production points for the, uh, the Germans. There's a little MF there, 20 production points. There's a 2, 20 there, and then a 0 over here. You just got to add up the difference. So it's 20 production points. Technically, that's going to be just four dice rolls. And if I get like four rolls of sixes and I would get, let's say, in theory, 24 production points, um, the maximum I can only get is five per roll. So that's just something to keep in mind. So you, you basically add up all this. That's going to be four plus six plus five. That is 15 production points this turn. Um, I think we did save a little bit of production from last turn. We did. Uh, the Mediterranean front, I'm seeing another three. So that's going to be four plus five plus three plus three. Um, I hope I did that right. Um, I just got to make sure. I, I think I did a few mistakes with the production, so I'm just trying to make sure that that won't happen again. Um, but I'm just going to go with what I have here because, you know, again, you know, I may, I may have done a small error there, but oh well. Hopefully the dice rolls, you know, the, the prob probabilistic nature of the dice rolls can kind of make up for that error. But basically we have 15 production points plus another three. That's a total of 18 production points for the Mediterranean theater. Um, the problem is that I can't even build up that many units, right? Because I would want to build up this uh, light Africa mech unit over here, um, but it costs nine production points. While building up this uh, Italian HQ would cost 10 production points. So I'm actually, that t in total costs 19 production points. But as of right now, I'm actually short of one production point for this, for this turn. So that is a complete bummer. So I can either um, decide to uh, save my production for another month, or I can go ahead and just spend it. And then whatever, whatever the, the, nine, the eight that are left remaining are pretty much going to be um, thrown away. And I'm not really sure what option I want to do. Um, I think since the Axis don't really have any more reinforcements in North Africa, I don't have to worry about like using this uh, Italian um, HQ, uh, this uh, Theor HQ. So I think I'm going to go ahead and save the production for March of 1942. And then I will add the 15 plus 3, that's 18 production points for the next turn.
So that's it for the axis. Um, then we'll go ahead and do Western Front production, which is at 27. Um, and so let me see how I want to build that up. Um, let's find out. Um, let's see here. I have a lot of production, but I don't have a lot of units to actually build up, which is kind of unfortunate. Um, but probably the first unit I want to build up is this uh, German uh, uh, armored core. So that's going to cost eight production points. Again, you can double check all of this on the unit data table. Uh, I pretty much have them pretty well memorized, but all the data that I'm getting is just from this data table for those who you who are wondering. So, you know, access, there's the armor costs eight per step. So we're putting up one step. So that's going to leave me with 19 production point for the remainder of the turn. Um, let's see. I also think I could bring up another um, militia unit. So let's go ahead and do that. I guess I'm going to put it over here in Paris. So that, that's free of cost because it's a reinforcement. Um, what else can I buy? I have still 19 left. Um, let's go ahead and uh, maybe build up uh, just our militia units. I think it would be pretty advantageous. So that's going to cost another three. So that brings me down to 16. I think with the remaining 16 that I have, um, I'm going to build one, uh, six, six production points on this airborne unit. Um, it is grounded. So, you know, normally it would cost 12 or paratrooper unit, but it costs half if grounded. So it's going to cost six. So basically some strong infantry there to defend. These fortress units have triple defense, which is really nice. Um, but they cost 10 production points for each build. So I could try to build up one. Um, I think I'm, I may actually go ahead and do that. I'm going to build up Cherbourg over here and build this up um, by another 10. And, um, and I think that should be enough for the, uh, for the uh, Axis defenses on the Western Front. So pretty uneventful production. But the overall strategy I'm trying to go for on the Western Front is that I have a mobile reserve that can reinforce, that can deploy units. Um, so I actually don't have OKW right now on the Western Front, so this would be a good time for the British to attack. Um, but at the same time, I want to be able to have enough static defenses that I feel confident holding the line for at least at least a few turns before the British can break through. So that's the overall theme there. Um, maybe I want to build up a, um, an HQ unit rather than build up my ground units. That might be a better investment. Um, and so since we are in the dead of winter, you know what, I think I am going to go ahead and actually uh, cancel this production. I'm actually going to go cancel all that 19 production. And all I'm going to do is just going to, I'm going to move it to the next turn. And I'm just going to give the, uh, the, uh, the Germans, rather, uh, 38 production in the production of April. So they're going to have a lot of production on the Western Front in, excuse me, in March of 1942. So we're just saving the production for next turn. It's going to be doubled. So actually, this should say 19 right now. So it's essentially going to be doubled. Oh, no, I'm sorry. It would be, it was just say 27. Holy moly. Wow, 27. Um, did I build up another unit? Yeah, I built this guy up. That was 19. Okay, yeah. So they're going to have, they're going to have 54 production, I think, on the next turn, if I did my math right. So they'll be able to build up a lot of units. And that's what I hope to see. And I like, I like having an even number of production. It, it's just more cost effective. Now on the Eastern Front, the Germans, um, I think we did a very smart strategy of just making sure all our infantry at full strength because they really are the, the main defensive unit against the Soviet attacks. Also, especially given how this German armor is affected by the winter paralysis, they, they only do single fire dice rolls. Um, because they cost double, in, 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 in they, they cost double than the infantry. I want my infantry to be the main units. So what can I build up? Uh, we have 69 production on the Eastern Front. I'm gonna go ahead and build up OKH. I'm also gonna build OKW. So this, this already is gonna cost me 30 production points, just these two HQs alone. So I'm now down to, uh, from 69 to 39 production points um, on, the, on this front. Um, we can build up a few more infantry. Um, but I'm, I think with 39, you know, that, that's, a, that's an odd number. So I don't think I'm actually going to be able to round off my production unless there's another mech unit that I could perhaps build up. And I'm just not seeing it right now. So that means that with the 39 production I have, um, I could go ahead and build up another HQ. Maybe we should actually build up Army Group Center's HQ 
build it up by one as well, just so that we have at least one level two HQ in the sector. Um, it is going to be disrupted because of the winter rules, but at the very least, we have the third one. So I'm spending three. Um, th uh, I'm spending 45 production points on just HQs alone on the eastern front. So from 69, we're now down to I think minus 45. That leaves me with 24 production points um, for the eastern front. Um, which is not, it's actually still a, a pretty handsome amount of production. Um, I really hope I'm doing my math right there. Uh, 45 plus 24 is 69. And um, according to the calculations I've had here, the Germans have had 69 because they took the industrial basins of the Ukraine, which are really beginning to pay off, it seems. So I'm going to go ahead and build up this core here. So I have 24. Uh, 24 divided by 4 is 6. So in theory, I can build up 6 infantry on this turn. So I just built one up there. We'll go ahead and build up these two units over here. So that leaves me with three left. Um, what else do I want to buy? Um, what other units, ground units do I want to buy? I mean, all my infantry are looking pretty healthy. Um, oh, let's build this guy up. So I've already spent four, I believe. I did, uh, I did one, two, three, four. Yeah, I got two more to build. Um, let's see here. One, two, three, four, um, two more. Or I can build a, a Panzer Corps, of course. Would be another option. Um, let's go ahead and uh, maybe build up the 47th Panzer Corps. Build that unit up to full strength. How about that? And that should, that should be enough production for this turn. Um, yeah. And I think we're going to stick to that for now. Um, so, yeah, that's it for the Germans. Uh, that was pretty fast production. Um, now, yeah, that's it. That's all That's all I'm going to do for the Germans. Or for the Axis, rather. I keep saying Germans, but it was not just Germany. Um, but all, all the main three main theaters have been covered. No production in the Northern Front. Um, now, I could bring up more re reinforcements, but not until April, it looks like. I get new units, so nothing on the month of February. So with that, we can now switch over to the Soviets. The only thing left is this uh, Finnish production. And I've been kind of tracking them separately in my mind, but um, I think they enter the war in September. So October, November, December, January, they receive production. I think I spent all that production as of the last turn. So right now the Finnish get three. Uh, what I'm going to do for the Finnish is just I'm going to, uh, here in the Western Front, I'm just going to use this marker, this little X blue marker and I'm gonna say that like starting in March you know we're gonna we're gonna skip the uh, we're gonna skip the production for the uh, uh, for the finish for this for this month um, really I mean the, the, the finished production is just gonna be spent on building um, building up the Finnish army really um, not much else so uh, we can now switch over to the Soviets or to the British uh, the Allies really and now go ahead and do their production. We'll start with the with the, the allied nations in the west, namely Britain. Um, we can look at their production. Uh, we'll start with the Mediterranean front, since that's really where the main fighting is taking place. British are trying to bring up new units. Um, let's see, do we get any reinforcements um, right now? Uh, I believe we actually get, uh, yeah, in February, we actually do receive this uh, US uh, division you know, or fifth fifth core. Um, so we're gonna deploy this unit. Uh, I'm not sure where. I want to deploy it. Uh, probably we'll we'll probably just put it. Um, I gotta actually read up on the on the rules as as far as where these units can even arrive. Um, so yeah, I gotta check up on that. But anyways, for the Mediterranean front, or AKA North Africa. Let's look at the British production. It's they're still at I believe 25. Yeah, they're at 25 production over here. So what I'm going to do is roll five dice, and they got let's see, that's nine. They got a total of 12 production. So not a whole lot. Um, yeah, the British are just under strength. I think what I'm going to go ahead and do is I'm going to activate. I'm going to activate this HQ here 
and then I'm going to just uh, forego the remaining two. Now over here on the Western Front, the British have, I think, slightly more production. Uh, they have 17 production, rather. Right? Um, yeah, they have 17 production on the Western Front. Now, according to this, I actually skipped over the production. So technically, they're going to have 34 production um, when we include what they gained from the last month. So they actually have 34 on the Western Front. So that's pretty good. That's really good for the British. Um, I think what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to transfer. I'm going to spend 20 on building up this uh, British HQ to a status of ready. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and do that on this turn. So that costs 20 production points. That only leaves me with 14 now. And, and keep in mind, this is a beachhead marker. Um, so, you know, all those rules are going to pertain to the, uh, basically the, uh, the amphibious rules. And if I scroll down over here, um, if we go in the rule book, there's a whole section that talks about sea power. And it is pretty lengthy, um, as most of the rule book tends to be just surprisingly lengthy. But, you know, they start talking about sea areas, which are just all these basins over here. Each, each basin being separated by those blue lines. You, we talk about sea control, which pretty much anyone that controls those dark, dark uh, naval bases controls that sea. You've got sea movement, which is pretty straightforward, um, but it's essentially supreme moves. Um, sea supplies, pretty straightforward. It's just supply lines that go through the sea areas. Um, some of them are going to be vulnerable to sea interdiction if you're moving it through enemy-controlled uh, uh, basins. Uh, siege supplies applies to ports um, that are contested. Um, and then probably the, the area where the rules start becoming a little bit more intricate, I think, for the, for the sea moves or for, this, for the sea aspect of the game are sea invasions. And sea invasions are just a special way of using your HQs, but they basically are a way to um, move your units not from, not, not from one friendly area to another, as sea moves would be, but to actually move them into enemy contested um, areas. And you can only do that through the sea, sea invasions. And, and essentially, the sea invasions, you don't even have to attack an enemy port. You can attack anywhere in which the terrain is valid, which, which tends to be a, quite, a, quite a number of places, pretty much anywhere but the, the areas where you see these blue shoals. And so the result of that, the, the consequences of that, are such that uh, you basically can do like your amphibious invasions that, that we're familiar with. Um, but there's a caveat, right, which is that if you decide to attack an area where there's an enemy controlled port, um, but you fail to actually capture the enemy port, how on earth are you going to supply your units? And this is where having these beachhead markers come in. They basically act as a mini uh, port that you can essentially build up when you launch your sea invasion. And they're activated at the supply phase at the end of the turn. But the idea is that you basically created a temporary port that can provide a supply source to your units. And so they are very helpful. Um, they, they, get, they get amplified with uh, naval supremacy, but the, the general premise is that if you want to attack an enemy area and there's no guarantee of actually having supplies arrive to that area, especially if it's enemy controlled, and especially if you don't have uh, a port under your control, then you wanna have a beachhead marker standing by. Now, technically you can launch amphibious invasions without the beachhead marker. But the problem is that you won't have your units in supplies. Now, another thing to point out about these beachhead markers is that here it says British 1. That actually refers to a particular unit. And you can see here that this is this British amphibious unit, indicated by its like the naval icon there. It is the British 1st Corps. And so this unit is the unit that uses the beachhead marker. And so, you know, not every unit has a beachhead. Only the amphibious units have beachhead markers. And you'll see with the uh, US reinforcements that, you know, as the US begins to bring up new units, you know, like the sixth core, they actually do get a, a beachhead marker ready, right? The second core also has a beachhead marker ready. But over here in December, you know, you have the seventh core, it doesn't have a beachhead marker ready until March, 1944. But then over here, it says the US fifth core does not actually pertain to the seventh core it actually pertains to the one that, that's just arriving on this month, right? So, so that's something to keep in mind as you play as the Western Allied Powers. It's just to be aware of the fact that your beachhead markers are not always available, even if your units are. 
So another way to think about it is that these these uh, infantry armies are pretty much standard armies, but but over time they all gain the access of having these amphibious uh, advantages, these, these these beachhead abilities. And you can think of these beachhead abilities as really just all the naval support. I know that, for example, historically in the war, um, the naval landing craft that the Allied forces needed to build in the thousands to actually be able to pull off these inv amphibious invasions and landing in like these difficult um, uh, beachheads, you know, it took time for them to actually build them up and assemble them and so on, just like any other ship. And so they, the Brit the the uh, the British and Americans. Part of their worst strategy was not just focusing on the army, it was focusing on the naval assets as well. So this game, in a very simplistic way, depicts that, but it depicts it in a very effective way, just like so many other aspects of this game. So with that said, um, the other thing I wanted to look up on is um, where can I actually place the British reinforcing units? Because I have this US unit, um, but I want to know if I can place it in um, in any town in Britain, or can I can I only place them in the major the major cities or the major ports? So let's check up on that. So here it says uh, you know newly rebuilt cadres must arrive in arrival locations. Arrival locations must be in rail supplies. Um, let's see here for the Allies. It says British U.S. and I think this is FF stands for Free French units can arrive in friendly major ports. British units can also arrive in home cities and French units in French major cities. Allied minor units arrive in their national capitals. So it looks like the US units can only arrive in friendly major ports. And so the only major ports that I have right now are London and Portsmouth. I could also put one in Liverpool. Maybe I can put another one in Bristol. Um, but I kind of want to put them all in Portsmouth because I want them to be ready for amphibious operations, right? That's the idea. Um, so if I look at when when will that beachhead even be available? Not until December 1943. So I, I really, for all sakes and purposes, this uh, this uh, American Corps that's arriving, for all sakes and purposes, it's pretty much acting like another infantry unit. And I, th I think right now the British have plenty of infantry right now. Um, here in, in Britain, what I want are special units. I'm also still trying to figure out what's going to be our strategy to invade, um, to attack, to attack uh, Norway. I still wanted to attack Norway, um, but at the very least, we've we've activated the beachhead marker there. Um, I think what I'm going to go ahead and do is then that leaves me with 14 production points for this turn, and um, I think what I'm going to go ahead and do is just build up my another HQ. And that leaves me with four production points left over. And those four, I guess I have really no choice but to spend it on infantry. Either that, or I can choose to cancel this beachhead production. And then maybe try to spend that in other ways. Um, I think for the sake of simplicity, I'm just going to focus on infantry for now. And that's it for the British, all right? Um, actually, did I want to transfer any production to the, to the Soviets? Um, I think that would actually be... A Pretty good idea to, to try to give the Soviets a little bit of lend lease during these during these winter months, especially, um, so they can have more offensive power. Although I, I frankly think the Soviets just are, are kind of running out of steam right now. Um, hmm. Yeah, it's definitely hard to say. Um, now I could also I got to figure out like what strategy do I want to do with the British. Do I want to invade Norway or do I want to invade um, uh, of France in 1942? Uh, or at least, at least to try, try some sort of diversionary raid or something to keep the Germans a little busy in this sector. I think, I think uh, yeah, it's hard to say. Um, it is definitely hard to say. And we only have one HQ available, really. I mean, we also have the Supreme HQ, but it's it's limited in its abilities. So it's it's a it's a tricky situation, I think, for the for the British. Um, but I would think the best strategy would be to uh, attack Traborg if we can, because it's only two two hexes away. So we could blitz on it. 
And by the way, the invasion HQs can blitz, and I can show you how that works. I think I may try to launch an attack on Triborg. We'll see. Um, or I could try to focus on Norway. I think I'm going to wait. I think I'm going to give Norway a little bit more time. But then, I mean, why on earth is this first unit way up there? It should be it should be here in the south ready to attack. Instead, I have it way up there in the north. Um, also, I know that this Canadian unit, I believe it actually does not receive the, uh, the acclimatization effects until... Uh, I believe summer 1942, um, or when when the um, the Allies deploy their uh, second front rule. And yeah, here it is. It says the Canadian Mech Corps become NF expeditions, right? And these are the units I would want to send to Norway to see if I can take something like uh, Bergen from the Germans. Um, I think I've I think I've already decided that if I want to invade Nor Norway. I'm going to have to launch a very long and complicated campaign to take Norway. And, and that is going to be like our strategy for 1942 for the Allies. Um, so, you know what? I think in the meantime, I'm going to cancel this British uh, HQ or, or beachhead rather. And then the remaining 10 that I have, uh, we're in February 1942. Hmm. The remaining 10, I think I want to spend it on some kind of lend lease to the soviets i think either that or i can try to build up a few other units if i can either way i mean the strategy is is definitely challenging um so anyways i don't know i can build 10 here with this unit and then that still leaves me with uh 10 more you know what i'm going to cancel this infantry here and then I'm going to go ahead and build up this armored core by one. So that's, that's going to cost me eight. And then I have six left. I'm going to spend that six on the second cavalry, second Canadian mech core there. Okay. And that should be enough for our turn. And that means I'm also giving the Soviets another transfer that won't arrive until March of 1942. Okay. So now for the Soviets, the Soviet production is at 50. Uh, we're not getting any land lease on this turn. So let's see the situation for the Soviets. Pretty uneventful here in the southern half of the front. Uh, we don't even have any HQs there for the Soviets. If I look at the dead pile, um, Soviet dead pile is pretty bad. But I think relatively speaking, you know, given that most of our dead units are just the kind of the mech and armored formations, the fact that I don't have very little infantry that are dead is a good sign. Um, but I actually don't know how many... Uh, combat value points I have, but um, I, I do feel like I'm a little short on on uh, Soviet manpower, quite frankly. But according to according to my setup, unless I've been deleting units, which I hope I haven't been doing, you know, I think the Soviets look pretty good right now. So um, overall strategy for the Soviets, uh, again, just trying to focus on my HQs. Um, that's probably the main priority. So we're going to build up the Western HQ, build up Stavka build up uh, the southern HQ as well so that's already th that's already 30 production points that I've spent uh, I also want to continue my offensive here in the north right I want to continue a push on Leningrad I want to see if I can take Leningrad I can tell you now that trying to take Novgorod is going to be really hard because the, the Germans have double defense in that forced terrain but maybe we can make a push on this 38th core try to take uh liberate Volkov or, or liberate the the, the contesting of Volkov, and then we can open up the supply path for Leningrad. And I think that needs to take priority. So no Southern HQ, I'm going to reduce you. We're going to focus on the Leningrad HQ instead. Um, and then, uh, yeah, that's, that's already 30 production points. I have 20 left. Let's go ahead and build up this Armored Core, which is going to cost us four. So now we have 16 production points left. And then I'm going to start building up whatever Soviet infantry I can in this sector. So now that's going to bring me down to from 16 to 14, from 14 to 12. Now we have 10 left. Right. Um, I have 10 left. What else can I build up? Um, just try to build up as much of the Soviet infantry. Uh, maybe we can build up these guys. That leaves me with only six production points left. Which is not a whole lot. So 
six production points left. Anything else I can build up? Um, as far as units, do we have any reinforcements for the Soviets? Um, I have this airborne unit that I can move up, but I don't think I need to right now. Um, the, the Soviet tank armies are not going to arrive until later. Um, really not a whole not a whole lot to build up with the Soviets, I'll be frank. Uh, not a whole lot. Uh, which is kind of, a, kind of a problem, if you ask me. Uh, I know that here in the central sector of the front... Uh, the, the German, the, the Soviet armies are going to be really vulnerable during a German summer offensive. So I really want to make sure I have a lot of mech formations in the central sector of the front. That's the only thing I can really say for certain right now as part of the uh, the Soviet strategy. The only other option I have right now is I could keep trying to push on Orsha, um, but I, I can tell you now that my Soviet units are a little under strength there. Uh, our chances of success, I think, are pretty minimal, especially given how constant you know it's. The, the area is really dense, so, you know, I can only move one unit in and one unit out. I would like to attack somewhere in the north if I can, um, but I think I'm going to have to, like, set up my formations in a slightly different way for that. So, you know, this is the last turn before we have, this is the last turn um, that we have good weather. So I think my main strategy right now, I think I really want to focus on trying to take Volkov if we can and so I really want to uh, maybe have another HQ standing by in the north in order to pull that off. I think that'll probably be our best bet. Um, but the only way that's going to happen is if I have another HQ that's, that's strong enough. And I'm also going to move up some reinforcements and, and so on. So anyways, um, I, spent, I spent 30 production points on Soviet HQs, right? And I just want to keep track of all the other units I spent. I did two there, two, another two there. So let's see, two, four, six, eight, uh, ten. And I think I think I still have ten left, right? Hope I did that right. So uh yeah, two, four, six, eight, ten. So that's already forty production points. Oh, plus over here, the armored unit. So I've actually spent fourteen. So I've spent 44 production points altogether, meaning I only have six left. Really not a whole lot, right? Um, and so the only the only other thing I can really think of doing right now is uh, I really want to focus on the north here. So I think my new strategy is going to be to transfer units up there and try to take Volkov as soon as possible. So I'm actually going to abandon the, the Western HQ. I'm going to reduce it by 10. I'm going to build up a... Uh, hmm... Or you know what? What I maybe maybe I should I'll leave that unit up at full strength. Yeah, I'm gonna leave that unit up at full strength, and that leaves me with six production points left over still. And I think what I'm gonna try to do with the six that I have remaining is just try to um, get my units to, uh, you know, just move them around, shift them around in such a way that I I know I feel confident that I have enough reserve units overall. So I say we just spend the rest on infantry, I guess. Question is, is which infantry? We have a lot of we have a lot of we had a lot of strong units here in the south, but unfortunately they didn't have any HQs, so I wasn't able to really support him. And I and I concentrated all my HQs here in the north, but I'm gonna have to change that in order for my current strategy to actually work. I think that I think that much is clear to me. Yeah, and I think I'm just going to spend the rest on infantry. But the overall, I think the overall idea I have in mind right now is to uh, try to get um, some stronger units to the north. And and I think that strategy I have very soon is because we're gonna we're gonna focus on Volkov because if we can if we can relieve the siege of Leningrad. We are gonna gain a big boost in production, and it, and it is gonna help significantly i do think um so yeah that seems to be a pretty decent strategy uh of course this 25th corps is a little vulnerable here in the north or 25th army rather um but but this this uh, red dotted line is um is is a uh is a very like extra long uh so so if the germans want to move into into uh, soroka they're gonna have to spend two supreme moves 
uh, to get their units marching. And they're going to have to do a double march in order to get to Soroka. And so I, I feel like we have a little bit of leniency there, a little bit of flexibility. Um, I don't want to abandon um, uh, Petro, Za, Petro Zavos just yet, although historically I know that the Soviets did. They did pull this unit out. And so, I mean, it is, it is a very juicy unit, right? I could use this unit and, and maybe get it um, here in the south. It would actually be able to support, uh, you know, Soviet offensives and so on. Uh, in that sector, right? Um, something to, to sort of keep an eye open for, I think. Keep, keep my eyes open for that. I'm also just thinking about, like, what units can I even reinforce over here in, in this sector? And, and, and truth be told, I just don't see too many Soviet units that actually can move around. Um, another thing I want to check up on is the Northern Front rules, um, because the Northern Front does have a few special rules. Um, and, and the main one is, is acclimatization which is the same rules that apply to the Mediterranean front. Both, both the northern and Mediterranean front, since they're just so far off the grid, they have these acclimatization rules. Um, but the idea is that new units that arrive to those theaters, they basically are penalized the moment that they walk into the theater. And so I just want to see what the rules are for... Um, uh, it says uh, NF aliens entering the Northern Front lose minus one acclimatization for the Soviets. Um, but I don't know if uh, the veteran units are exempt. It says Northern Front and veteran units have a V, which is the Soviets. Uh, they're unrestricted. Unrestricted, they incur only minus one acclimatization entering the Northern Front and are exempt from Arctic maintenance. Okay. So, yeah, they, they just suffer a minus one. So I think, I think I'm going to pull out the 7th Corps and uh, maybe try to move it over. And then I can bring up this 14th core um, in, as a reinforcement, right? Um, so I think I'm gonna do that. We're gonna reduce this unit by two, build this guy up by two. And then um, just try to keep my eyes open for any other type of units that I would want to move around while I can. And, and truth be told, I mean, the Soviets do have some strong units nearby. Um, but not as many as I had, as, as you would, as you would think, and not, not as many as I would hope for, right? Uh, plus, the situation in Smolensk is still very, very tenuous for the, for the Soviets, right? We still have some very weak units there. Um, so it would be nice if we could beefen up Smolensk if we can. But the main priority I decided is Volkov. So that's it for the Soviet production. Um, we did the British production. We did the uh, Axis production. Um, so now let's go insert the turn. So I'm going to end the log file here. And then we're going to start the winter turn. 1942, February, in the month of February. So the Soviets do have the initiative. And I think what we're going to go ahead and do is I'm going to activate Stavka. And then I'm going to move around a number of units. So first of all, I'm going to move the Western HQ. And I'm actually going to move it like here, I guess. Maybe I'll put it right, I'll put it right here, actually. Yeah, that's where I want it. Then I'm going to go ahead and move um, another unit, this guy. I'm going to move these, all these units are being moved by a rail, by the way. So uh, 10 moves for each uh, rail move, 10 hexes, right? Th only through friendly territory, of course, not through enemy controlled territory. Let me see, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So yeah. A lot of units that I'm trying to reinforce right now to Volkov, I mean, if they were to move all the way around, it would take way too long, right? Oh, you know what? I forgot to do, oh, oh, fudge. I forgot to do one Soviet adjustment in the production, I just realized. Uh, dang, Nabbit. It's not, it's, I guess it's too late, right? Ah, it's too late, but we're going to just have to make do with what we have, unfortunately. Um, hopefully, they, hopefully it still works, my, my plan of action. But anyways, one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Right, so that's one real move. So I've done two using Stavka. I can indicate that by my my strategic rail movement markers that they have here. Okay, so that's two strategic moves. Um, I can do a few more. Next one I want to do is we're actually going to um, I'm going to make an attack with the Leningrad HQ, believe it or not. I don't think I'm going to blitz 
on this turn. Maybe I should. You know what? Maybe. You know what? We are going to blitz. We're, we're going to blitz with this HQ. So I'm going to keep this uh, second uh, Soviet shock army on the side there. This guy, he's going to blitz. Okay. And what I'm going to do is now this unit gets command some units. I'm moving the cavalry, who, by the way, can move through swamps without any sort of uh, in, impediment. So that, that's the right term. Um, but I'm going to move 2nd Cavalry uh, Corps from Tikvian, uh, attack the flank, and then I'm moving the 12th Armored Corps into Volkov. So two Soviet units are now moving up. I'm going to pull back the 4th Soviet Shock Army from, from, uh, from uh, Novgorod there. And what I hope, I hope is that our 12th Army can defend against any German uh, attacks or anything like that. So uh, those are, those are non-Supreme moves. Uh, I'm going to do two more Supreme moves, however. I'm going to move the 7th Corps here, or 7th Army. I'm going to actually move it. Uh, we can put it, we can put it at Tikvian. So that's uh, just a few rail moves. And then I'm going to move the 14th Army. And I'm going to have it move up to Petro, uh, uh, Petro, Zal what is it? Petro Zalvotsk. Okay, and then it's going to suffer one because of acclimatization. So we've already done four uh, strategic rail moves for the Soviets, right? And we have two more left. And the remaining two that I want, I think that I think another good move would be to move this 31st uh, Infantry Army into Smolensk and just beefing up the defense there. That leaves me with only one more move left. And I really don't have much, right? I really don't have much. Um, so the question is, is well, what other, what other unit do I want to move around or, or you know, something of that nature, right? Um, so I think I'm going to move the 22nd right over here. And I'm actually going to readjust this 4th Corps, or 4th Army, rather. And I'm going to move it to, it, move it over there to Staraya Rusa. And then we'll move this HQ into the rail. I guess we can pull it back, right? Um, I guess it can it can stay put for all I care. Um, okay, I guess we'll put it here. So the idea is um, hopefully that's enough. So I did one, two, three, four, five, and then six. So six strategic moves, right? Uh, four of which were rail moves, uh, two of which were not. The twenty second army was moving to the north. Right, it's moving, uh, it's marching, right, because there's no rail line in this little area that it was in. And then the 31st is entering a contested area. And so to, to move units into a contested area, you want to, of course, um, you want to, of course, uh, it, it won't be a rail move, is what I'm trying to say. So that's it for the Soviets. Now, the Stavka does have air support, and I'm wondering if I can use it to air support any particular area, right? And, I mean, I'm wondering, I mean, there seems to be a pretty good incentive, if you ask me, to perhaps, uh, I don't know, perhaps uh, continue my attack on Novgorod, right? Because, I mean, I mean, we have air support, so we might as well attack, I think, Uh and try to try to maximize our firepower. That's the idea, um, but it, it may it may work. It may not. Right? Um, it may work. It may not. Um, yeah, I just realized that I actually want this fourth. Uh, I actually want this fourth uh, army to move over here as well. There's a reason why I'm doing that. So the only problem I have with my setup is that Staraya Rusa is undefended right now by the Soviets and I'm just wondering if is there a better alternative is there a better is there another strategic option that I can come up with that would maybe help remedy that problem it's hard to say because um, I just don't have any more strategic moves right I did one two three four and then five six up here in the north so it is a bit of a problem. Maybe I uh, don't reinforce uh, Petro's, uh, what is this, Petro Zavotsk. Maybe I don't reinforce that area at all. Maybe I just leave it as it is, right? It's hard to say. 
Uh, all I know is that Volkov is definitely going to be where the main battle takes place. Um, but I would like to have one more unit in Staraya Rusa if I can. And the 22nd Army here is in a great position. But um, I just need one more unit to, to move up. And so... Um, And so, yeah, it, it, it is a bit of a, a logistical challenge, if you ask me right now, this, this situation for the Soviets. Um, I kind of want to move up another infantry corps to, to the situation over there in Leningrad if I can. So, you know what? I think I'm going to cancel this, this rail move, uh, which I know is not ideal. Because now we're, we're just abandoning Petro Zavos altogether. Um, but I guess it's an area that I'm willing to abandon. Hopefully that was a good call. But what I'm going to do instead is try to really focus on Leningrad. And uh, what I want to do is move this 16th Corps, or 16th Army, keep getting those two terms mixed up as I'm talking, then we can move that unit there. And, and that way, you know, I've, I just feel a bit more confident um, of my overall setup right now for the, for the Soviets. Right, and that's like that's the main that's the main thing to to focus on is just to make sure that you know I'm, my setup is is pretty pretty confident over on the north, and and I like this setup because we're trying to maximize our firepower right now on an area like uh, here in the north, and, and that's what I like to see. Now, um, as far as air support, um, I guess I'm not going to attack um, Novgorod. I think it's going to be too risky. So the air support. Is going to come from Stavka that has a range of six. And if you count the hexes from Moscow, we got one, two, three, four, five, six. It's in range of attacking Volkov. So we can, all, unfortunately, you can only put one, one airstrike per hex. So, I mean, ideally, I would have two air supports, right? One from Stavka, the other from the Leningrad HQ on Volkov. But for some reason, the game doesn't allow that. I'm not sure why the developers didn't allow that. Maybe it created too much of an imbalance. You can only pick one. So I might as well pick the one that has the stronger dice roll, uh, while the other one is basically neglected, unfortunately. But uh, hopefully we can um, have a successful attack in the north, um, and maybe we can relieve the siege of Leningrad, boost up the Soviet production, if at all possible. Um, so that's that. Um, anything else I really want to do for the Soviets? Not much else for this turn. Um, so I can now... Uh, we can now do the combat phase, right? So that was, you know, activation or, or command phase, movement phase. Now let's see the combat phase. The main battle that we're focusing on right now is the Battle of Old Kolf, right? Oh, this, this unit here was also a rail move. Let me put a little rail marker on that. Also, you know, as you'll see in a moment, you know, the units that move by rail cannot blitz, right? And I think that makes good sense. So anyways, let's do this battle. Uh, Battle of Volkov. I'm pretty excited. Let's see if the Soviets can break through. We're attacking with a 3 to 1 numerical advantage. Probably more than that, because the Soviets had more troops relative to the Germans. Uh, three German divisions, presumably about, uh, we'll say, you know, each division may, may be about 14,000 men, maybe 12,000 men. They may be under strength. Four, four German divisions. Um, we'll say it's four German divisions, each with about uh, 12,000 men. So you're looking at about maybe something on the order of 40 to 50,000 German troops. Um, the Soviet armies here, um, I believe each Soviet army probably has about anywhere from 50 to 100,000 men. The Soviet cavalry corps, probably the same order. So you're probably looking at something around the order of about 150,000, give or take, 100 to maybe 150,000 Soviet troops attacking Volkov right now. So let's see the battle. Airstrike scores one hit. The defenders have um, double defense. Now, the thing about swamp terrain, if you look at the rules for terrain effects and you look at the swamp rules, right, or they call it marshes, I call them swamps, but it says that for firepower, um, the offensive fire is single fire, right? That's something to keep in mind. Um, typically for the swamps, um, the offensive fire is single fire, meaning that no matter how many good units I were to attack in a swamp area, even if I were to send in like, you know, triple fire units, they only have single fire. But because it's winter, the swamps turn into forest terrain during the winter. You can think of it as the, uh, the marshes freezing over. And I don't know if there's anything that says anything here. 
Um, anything on this on this uh, this player aid that explains that? Um, talks about weather. Um, but uh, it talks about terrain effects. But I'm not seeing anything. Oh, here it is. Weather 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 effects. Uh, during the snow, the marshes equal forest, right? The rivers freeze, no repulse, um, which which hopefully, I, if I didn't clarify that in the last few turns, hopefully that was, I, I didn't mention that um, in the last video when we attacked. Some of you may have been thinking, shouldn't there have been a repulse in Novgorod? But no, um, when you have snow effects, the rivers also freeze, so there is no repulse that we have to worry about. Uh, but yeah, this player aid pretty much has everything you need to understand the rules of the game. And so we are in winter. So anyways, the Germans are going to roll their defense. They score one hit. We'll place it on the cavalry. And now the Soviet armor get the roll. These are our main units. They score one hit. Nice. And then we have four single fire dice. Okay. So we only scored one hit, unfortunately, against the, uh, the Germans, but we are making progress. And the other nice thing to point out is that the Germans are not able to reinforce Novgorod, or excuse me, reinforce Volkov because Novgorod is contested. And, and so that was part of our strategy there. Um, so that's it. That's it going to be for the uh, the Soviet first round of combat. Uh, no other battles taking place anywhere else. I could have done unsupported combat uh, here east of Orsha. Chances are that's probably what they would have done historically. But uh, I know the Germans have some strong units. I'm not even going to bother attacking. Maybe I could have. Maybe I should have. Uh, that probably would have made it for a slightly more interesting combat. But... You know, I'm still developing my own kind of play style in this game. So, you know, that's where we're at right now. Um, so, with that said, uh, we can now do the Blitz phase. So I'm just going to remove the Blitz marker, reduce the Leningrad HQ by one. And now we're ready to Blitz into Volkov. And what I'm going to do for this Blitz, I'm actually going to move this 4th Shock Army into Volkov. Now, the thing about us, uh, the marsh terrain is that they do have a stacking limit of only three. So all the other areas, even forest uh, and clear, have a stacking of four. Uh, mountains only have a stacking of two, um, including uh, technically the, uh, the, the, this tundra terrain is, is the same thing as mountain terrain. Um, but, but I can only put three units in here. So right now I'm breaking the stacking limit rules. So all I'm going to do is pull out the 52nd. Soviet army, since it's the weaker army. You know what? I'm actually going to probably leave it there for now. I, I kind of wanted to pull out the cavalry because the cavalry is a little bit more flexible. Um, yeah, we probably will do that instead, I think. I'm going to pull out... Um, we'll go ahead and we'll leave, the, we'll leave the, that, that unit there. But I'm going to pull out this cavalry just the same way he came in. I'm going to send it out. And I'm going to try to move it a little bit more south. So that hopefully, if the Germans do try to attack Novgorod, I can reinforce it. No problem. Yeah. And uh, I, I realize I may have done another mistake. Um, but oh well. You know, learning. Learning as I play the game. Um, but anyways, we can do the battle now. We're going to attack. Um, so I pulled out my weaker units. Um, but now I have two double fire units that I hopefully are enough to to take Volkov. But I only have a airstrike of one now because the Leningrad HQ is at level one. So let's go ahead and do it. Dice roll, no hits. Defenders, they still score one hit. That's a bummer. Um, I'm going to put it on the shock army. So now we only have five dice for double fire. Let's see if we can score any hits. Uh, please infantry, dang it, no hits. Okay. So unfortunately, our attack. For all sakes and purposes, our attack had failed there, which is a bummer. But at least we are hopefully making some progress. So uh, we spent a blitz. It was a very expensive um, uh, effort to blitz on Volkov, and still it wasn't enough to actually take it. So that's a bummer. Um, but uh, that's just the cost of an of a unsuccessful attack, pretty much. So that's it for the Soviets. Um, now we're going to switch over to the Axis turn. Switch over to the Axis, and let's see what the Axis do. Um, I think now, I think it's very clear to me that another good move for the Axis is to take Petrozavodsk. Petro you can do that by activating the Matterheim HQ, moving this, uh, oh, actually, you know what? 
I see one weakness with this Mannerheim HQ unit, which is that we have no we have no secondary units here in this area. It's kind of hard to read. In I think it's called a uh, Juensu. So even if I were to move this unit to Petro Petrozavodsk, um, it actually leaves this area vulnerable to a Soviet counter move. So what I'll do is I'll activate the Mannerheim HQ, and I'll move this uh, third. Uh, finish core up there and it will act as a reserve over there and then I, I also go ahead and move the Mannerheim HQ over there as well so we're, we're basically assembling a, a nice little task force to attack I think what I'm also going to do is I'm going to activate uh, the Dito HQ and I'm going to do a force march what I'm going to do is going to have one of these uh, one of these German units uh, march up forward yeah, you know what? I'm going to actually undo all those moves that I just did. What I'm going to do instead is activate the Dito HQ. It's going to do a double march. I'm going to go ahead and move um, one of these German units and have it move to Soroka. It's going to cost all our supreme moves, right? So we're going to be now exhausted there. But it actually protects the flank. Now the fourth core can move up there, no problem. And and so, yeah, we're, we're, we're basically just... Entering this territory, there's not much to gain right now. We've already taken Mormansk, but I just don't see how else to use this Dito HQ right now. So that's that. I'm going to move this Mannerheim HQ via rail over there. And that will be that. Uh, so we got a new battle up there. Made some counter moves over there in the north. But I can tell you the Axis troops feel very spread out thin over here. I'll, I'll tell you that much. Um, so that's that. Uh, other moves for the Germans to do, well, um, you know, there really isn't much that Germans can do, quite frankly. Uh, you know, you know, the Soviets aren't attacking anywhere else along the front, which is actually a nice little respite for the Germans, for the Axis, but mainly the Germans. Um, I don't really feel the, compelled to use any of the, uh, the OKH moves. So, you know, we're just going to, uh, you know what, I guess I'll go ahead and activate... Uh, OKW, since it um, it is going to be disrupted, and what I'll do is I'll rotate these units over here. So I'm going to pull uh, these two these two guys uh, out. Oh, and I can only put one unit in there. I see. Here, you know, we're going to move these two units over here. Then I'll move this infantry corps in there. So that's two moves. The I can do a third move. Uh, but I'm not even sure where I would want to even do the third move. Or the fourth move, rather. I'm actually going to go ahead and start moving this unit up to Leningrad. 54th uh, Corps here that has the uh, these three dots represent heavy mortars. Um, but they don't arrive until the summer of 1942. So I'm going to go ahead and just start moving these units via rail. And just try to get them moving up north. It's going to take a while. So anyways, one, two, three, four... Five, six, uh, seven, eight, nine, ten. I can't move through a Bachmach because technically this area is a disputed hex, so no one controls the rares there. But anyways, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yeah, that's as far as we go. One more supreme move, and we can get that core probably in the vicinity of Leningrad. So that's it. Um, that's it for OKW. Now, do I want to send OKW over to the uh, Western Front? I probably do. Um, before I do anything uh, on the Western Front, I need to actually do the weather dice roll, which technically I haven't done yet. You can see, oh no, uh, yeah. If you look at the February turn, you can see that it's a dice roll on the Western Front. So we'll do two dice. It is um, f an odd number, so it is going to be mud for the month of February. So basically, you know, British aren't gaining gaining much. They're not gaining they're not gaining uh, much there. Um, we also have to check for the storm table. So we did a dice roll of five, um, five or nine. Oh, so five actually applies to the Atlantic Basin, um, meaning that if the British wanted to launch an amphibious invasion, I don't think they actually could on this turn because of the storms. And uh, we can double check the rules in the rule book to just make sure. 
um, the rules on the storm, the effects that storms have. I think that was after production, right? Somewhere around the middle of this rule book. Uh, talking about sea power, sea movement, paratroopers, HQs. Here's sea storms. And it says storm effects, no sea invasion movement is possible through affected areas. Yeah, that's right. And then beachheads are also affected by those, by the storm effects. But they do not affect um, the regular sea supply or sea movement. So yeah, that means that the, uh, the Germans are not going to have to worry about a British invasion of anywhere coming from the Atlantic Ocean right now. So that's pretty convenient for the... Uh, for the axis for this turn um, and then uh, no dice rolls for the eastern front although i think i think actually we still have to do a roll for the weather yeah for the storms on the eastern front but it's even so there is no storms okay so that is that um, for the axis any other moves that the axis want to do uh, we could try to launch a counteroffensive in north africa if we wanted to spice things up you know try to attack the british here um, we could uh, but I don't think I want to, uh, although I think I should. <laughs> Maybe we should. This would be a great opportunity to, like, try out a North African counteroffensive. Um, another thing to point out about the Mediterranean front is that the supply range is one hex, right, from, from the supply origin. And so that means that if we were to, say, theoretically take Tobruk, um, or, or actually, yeah, if we were to take Tobruk and bead Hakim, we would actually have these British units cut off. Or another way to look at it is if we attack Derna and we actually destroy the British units at Derna, uh, we would cut off the, the, the British units at Anzio. And you know, I, I'm really tempted to do it and I think I'm gonna go for it because right now our supply basin for the Axis is still here. We still have a supply base coming in from, from this area here. Even though it's contested, it is friendly controlled. So we do have a railhead right here. Or, you know, maybe not a railhead. Technically, it would be a supply head, right? Um, but I'm just going to use the railhead marker to indicate supplies. So, you know, I'm going to try a very unorthodox move. I'm feeling a little ambitious right now with the axis. I want to kind of spice up the game anyways. We're going to activate the Africa Corps. And we're going to go ahead and do another. We're going to do a blitz of our own. Okay. I'm going to send the Africa Corps in full strength. Supported by this 20th uh, Italian Mech Corps. Two units. Six divisions all, to all together. We're attacking Gurna. We are in, in range, so that's really good. And then the, the Italian 10th Army can move um, in, uh, in behind as a rear guard. And then we also have this light Africa force that it can also move up. And it, it can act as a rear guard. So we, we can just go, go full attack right now against the British. And we can attack with airstrike. So I'm excited. We're, we're going we're gonna to do it just to keep this game pretty refreshing. Hopefully not create too much of an Axis bias as, as so many games happen to be. Mo I, would, I would argue that in most World War II games, the, the German side is the side that tends to be a little OP. And that's just, that's just simply because a lot of players like to play as Germany, right, in World War II. Play as the Wehrmacht, right? So anyways, we got a number of areas to do battle. Uh, we can start up here in the north. This is an unsupported combat, um, but it's basically a recon in force. So it's get to roll um, defending. They score one hit. We get to roll, um, but we, we needed to score uh, three three dice rolls to score one hit because it is it is a forced terrain technically because uh, it's a winner and it's a it's a marsh, and we have no combat support. So that's a bit of a problem, right? Um, so uneventful, you know. But at least we've contest, contested the hex there. That's that. Any other battles here in, in the Eastern Front? I don't think so. Um, I think I'm going to leave my OKH in, uh, in Warsaw. Um, and then now we get the North African battle. This should be pretty interesting. So let's see what the British have here located in Derna. Let's see what the British have here. British have uh, strong defending units. They have a lot of mech units. Um, so this is probably a good time for me to start talking about some of the more Mediterranean front rules. Again, in the rule book, there's a whole section that's dedicated to all the fronts, and we want to read up on the Mediterranean front. And there it covers all the rules. So, you know, right now it's telling me about the different nations. I think it's after this section. Uh, maybe it was before. Here it is. 
Uh, section 21.0 is the fronts. We got the Western Front, the Eastern Front, and the Mediterranean Front. This is what we're focusing on. So I want to talk a little bit about the supply um, and things like that. Supply lines can only can no can be no longer than one hex. That's one thing to keep in mind. Another thing to keep in mind about movement. Um, you know, there's something called strategic road movement, which is pretty much the same thing as rail moves, but they're just more limited in distance because you're using roads rather than rails. And as you can see, you know, this brown line here is not a rail line, it's a road. So, you know, the, the, those, in other words, the supplies are just that much more complicated uh, and, and the movement is a lot more limited. Um, another thing to point out, I think, when it comes to the Mediterranean front is off-road movement, which basically says any units that are moving off-road are penalized, um, their speed is penalized by one, right? So that means that, you know, even though these, these mech units technically have a range of three typically, because they started in, in Masseuse and they moved to Derna, they've actually moved two hexes across, and that is their maximum range that they can do. That is their maximum range. Likewise, um, this Italian army, right, the 10th army that was also located in Masseuse, because it's going to move to Mikili, that's as far as it can go, because typically it can move two hexes like any other infantry unit can, but you can see that there is no road between Masseuse and Mikili, so it, it can only move one hex across. And then likewise, this, uh, you know, this German Light Africa Corps of sorts can move from Benghazi, and typically it can move three, but because it's moving from Masseuse to Mikili and there is no rail, there's no road junction there, it has also reached its maximum distance of two hexes rather than three, right? So that's that. Um, and so maximum movements have been achieved, um, but now let's do the battle. We have airstrike, uh, air support. We can look at the axis, and the Mediterranean front is going to be double fire uh, for winter 41. Um, I don't know if I have any airstrike markers. Uh, technically, I guess it's the same. Yeah, it, it, the, 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 the Allied production is going to be the, the HQ, the, uh, the firepower markers are basically going to be the same as what we see over here. Is, is, there, is there firepower? So, we have double fire for air support. Let's see what we can do. Wow, three hits. Already, the, the Luftwaffe just smashes the British uh, defenses. And now the British are less than they're at 50% combat strength just from the air support. Uh, so the Luftwaffe was absolutely devastating. They get to roll three dice, they score no hits. Here's another rule that I wanna point out when it comes to attacking units um, in, in the, uh, in the uh, Mediterranean front. And uh, let's see if I can find it here. There's a bunch of rules as well as like, you know, controlling the hexes and these bases. Um, but the one rule I wanted to point to is the uh, firepower, the combat advantages, and here it is. It says, in desert terrain, armor fires triple fire and double fire um, for attack and defense, respectively. Uh, mean, likewise, mech get to fire double fire for attacking, um, but the Desert Africa Corps, right, which is the, you know, the, the elite German, you know, Rommel Africa Corps, gets quadruple fire while attacking, triple fire while defending. So this unit here, this DAK, is a very super elite unit. It gets to have quadruple fire, meaning that it can score hits on three, four, fives, or sixes. We have a two and three chance of scoring a hit with these rolls, while this uh, mech unit pretty much acts like armor, has double fire. And I think the reason why that's the case is because when you look at the uh, Mediterranean or, or the North African campaign, you'll see that there's like no cover in, in the terrain. Uh, so most of the defensive lines, I think, were usually some trench lines at best, um, but usually you're fighting in open combat, meaning that the more mobile your formations were, the, the you had some notable tactical advantages because you could literally attack the enemy's flank quite easily. Now, of course, there was a lot of downsides to fighting in, in North Africa. You know, the, the dust storms would pick up a lot. Visibility was extremely limited. The logistics were a complete mess. Um, but, you know, at least in this strategic picture, we have some notable advantages. So, so there's a clear incentive to attack 
um, with your units in North Africa. In fact, it's better to attack than to defend. And so anyways, let's see um, what, how the, uh, the uh, DAK uh, rolls. They get quadruple fire and they score three hits. Okay, they, they score three hits and they've just wiped out the remaining two uh, British Corps. So that was a big defeat for the British. And, um, and we still get to blitz, don't we? We still get to blitz. Uh, so we've just cut off the, uh, the, uh, the um, Anzac troops there. This was a terrible defeat. Um, this was like pretty much as bad as the battle of... Uh, uh, there was a battle over here um, that, that devastated the British historically. Um, the name of the area started with a G, and I forget what it was, but I can't think of it right now. So anyways, um, that totally changed the situation in just in one swift go. Um, any other battles that we're doing anywhere else? No. So we'll go ahead and do the Blitz. What I'm going to go ahead and do is I'm going to send the Italian 10th Army, which now can um, attack Tobruk. It can march into Tobruk. I'm going to contest Tobruk. And then I'm going to go ahead and send all my other units... Oh, I have to be, oh, you know what? Uh, I got to be wary of my supply lines. Technically, our supply line is still, is still here. Right? Because um, this, this area is contested. And we don't have any other supply lines going anywhere else. So that, that is a bummer. That is a, that is a serious bummer, actually, um, for the, uh, for the axis. It means that. You know, as much as I want to attack to Brook, any units that choose to attack to Brook will be out of supplies when they when they when they attack. And it's only until we're able to clear up the uh, the uh, Anzac troops that uh, we'll be able to actually open up the, uh, the front line. Um, so that's that. Another thing I want to check up on is the rule for fortress combat, because I think. There are rules pertaining to mandatory combat in fortress areas, even if they don't have combat support. And I know that applies to the big fortresses, but I wonder if it applies to small fortresses. It says combat is mandatory for the original attacker during active turns. Um, yeah, okay. So, so we're going to have to do combat even if, even if um, we don't have combat support. Oh, but here it is for minor, for minor fortresses. It says combat is not mandatory for original attacker after the initial attack. Unsupported combat can have effect versus minor fortresses. Interesting. Uh, but for the major fortress, like, like uh, Leningrad, I'm pretty sure um, uh, no combat support doesn't give you any attack. Um, Combat is mandatory. Original defenders have triple defense, passive combat. They also have repulse air, triple fire dice rolls. The largest defending unit has triple fire when passive. Um, I could have sworn there was an, a rule. Oh, here it is. Unsupported combat against a fortress hex is ineffective. Right. No offensive hits can be scored. Defender still returns triple fire. Yeah, so that's pretty unfortunate for the attackers. But it says here, uh, unsupported combat can have effect versus minor fortresses. Pretty sure minor fortresses provide double defense, not triple defense, um, for combat uh, for the largest defending unit. So if we attack to Brook, we're going to attack with uh, against against double defense. Um, but we don't actually have to worry about like you know, having like repeated attacks without any combat support. So that's the good, that's the good news that I see. Um, the only other thing to point out is I, I kind of want to take out this Anzac group as soon as possible, because the sooner we can wipe them out, the easier it is, the easier it's going to be for us to uh, try to clear out um, our supply lines so that we can attack to Brook a bit more easily um, in, 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 some, in some sort of future turn, right? Um, so I'm going to try a number of moves right now. I think what I'm going to try to go ahead and do to kind of speed up operations, I'm going to go ahead and move the 10th Italian army to attack the Brook. I'll go ahead and, and this may be a, this may not be the right move, but I'll go ahead and move the Africa core into, to attack the Australians here as well, just to kind of accelerate our supply situation a bit. And then, you know, um, 
I would ideally like to have this route cut off so that the British can't retreat via land. They can only retreat via sea. Uh, I think essentially forced to book under siege supply rules. It's going to make it that much harder for the British to pull out. Plus, there's also um, uh, limited supplies. So yeah, I think we'll go. We'll, we'll make attack with advance this Italian unit to uh, beat Hakim. And now it's going to control the uh, hex here at Solum. And then I'll move this Light Africa Corps in Dorna. So two Italian units. I'm expecting two Italian units to be out of supplies on this turn. But I'm hoping that it's enough to pin down these British units. Uh, we still have uh, more air support. And I can use this air support to attack this area uh, east of Bars. So with the Africa Corps and the airstrike, we should have some pretty good firepower there. And of course, we have these Italian militia units supporting. And then uh, let me just check up on uh, the uh, fortress supply rules as well. Uh, here it is, fortress supplies. I think it says the largest defender is supplied. All other units are unsupplied and suffer supply attrition. And that's what we want. There's two British units in Tobruk. So one of them will, have, um, will, will su suffer the attrition of no supplies. And that's essentially what we're trying to, trying to achieve is... Uh, constrict the, the British there. Um, so yeah, uh, interesting moves for the Axis. All right, so let's do it. Let's go ahead and do this battle here. Um, we're going to attack, counterattack technically, since our units are were originally defending. Uh, we're attacking with the Africa Corps, our strongest units. Airstrikes get to roll. It's no hits. The, the Anzac get to roll. They score no hits either. The Africa Corps now gets to roll with their quadruple fire. Dang, they only scored one hit. The Italian infantry now get to roll. Boom, we scored one hit. Okay, so we scored we scored at least one hit there. The the, the British had double defense because of the, the hill country, which is this this brown territory that you see there. All right, so interesting move. We'll deactivate our HQ. Uh, let's now do the battle of Tobruk. Uh, the British had strong units in Tobruk, the 10th Corps, um, but they also have this mech unit there. Or, or, excuse me, their HQ is there, and that's very vulnerable. Um, uh, so the British HQ right now is under attack. Uh, the British are going to defend. They score three hits against these poor Italians. Holy moly. Italians just got wrecked. And then so much, in fact, that the Italians can't even... They can't even... Um, they won't even be able to, to do any damage, even if they, they... They only have one dice roll. They need to score at least two, two dice. So, um, touche. Touche there. Um, but that's going to be it. That's going to be the Axis turn. Uh, British suffered a lot of losses, but it goes to show that the uh, Axis losses are not scot-free either. Um, anyways, uh, this unit's going to be out of supplies. One of these British units are going to be out of supplies. I'm not sure which one yet, but one of them will be out of supplies. Um, okay, so that's going to conclude the Axis turn for this month. And... Um, yeah, now I'm going to switch over to the British, and we'll wrap up this turn with with this with this. Um, uh, yeah. So yeah, um, British situation is not looking good. I think what I'm going to do is uh, put the supply penalty. Believe it or not, I'm going to put the supply penalty on the HQ unit because I want I want us to hold on to De Brook as long as possible. Um, and then the most obvious move that I can do for the uh, for the British right now. Uh, so the, the supply attrition goes to the to the HQ. This Anzac unit is going to also suffer supply attrition. I, I should have hit these uh, German units again because they were defending. Technically, the Soviets were defending up here in Volkov, so they should also be hidden, right? Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to activate this HQ, our uh, our basically our regional HQ, our theater HQ. And we're going to do one supreme move. This is going to be a C move. Um, I actually, oh, you know what? I just realized that we can't even do, we can't even do a C move right now with that unit. That's a bummer. Hold on. I'm going to go back to the C supply rules. And if I read up on um, C movement, right? It talks about C movement. Uh, there's also poor capacity to C movement. Um, but I think it says, sea movement passes freely through friendly or neutral seas. No, that's not what I'm looking for. It says sea movement through enemy controlled. Nope. Um, 
I want to know about uh, removing units from a contested hex. Hmm. See lanes, poor capacity, see control. So um, invasion movement, oppose, see assaults, repulse, blitz, long range. These are all the invasion moves. Uh, we got interdiction. Hmm. The rules I'm trying to look for is I'm pretty sure there's a rule that says you can only move C moves through uncontested hexes. Oh, here it is. Units cannot engage by C movement, but can disengage if a rear guard is left behind. Thank goodness. So we're going to activate this HQ and we're going to move this HQ via C. Move it all the way back to Alexandria, and we're falling back to Alexandria. We only have one strong British unit in the sector, and it is completely like out of position, right? So, uh, situation for the British pretty untenable right now in North Africa. I think another favorable strategic move that the British should do is try to reinforce North Africa with more units. So, I'm actually going to go ahead and activate this uh, Afri uh, this this uh, Allied Force Supreme HQ. I'm going to go ahead and move this uh, tank unit um, across the English Channel, across the Atlantic Ocean. Okay, I'm doing uh, two supreme moves, right? And I'm moving it all the way to South Africa. And that's the maximum range I think I can do for supreme, for, for the, the, uh, for the sea supply moves, maybe I can move them, move it further. That's a good question. I don't know if I can. That's another question to explore. Um, but let's see. Uh, a unit can move to any other friendly port on the same sea area for one sea move. TSU moves are required to move between friendly ports across two sea areas. Right. Um, I just want to know, I believe units are, are required to stop um, when they're moving um, through the uh, Cape of Good Horn, right? Oh, yeah, it says must stop right there. There it is. So, yeah, I, I've been doing it right, thank goodness. But I can't just go all the way around in two weeks. It takes a little bit more time than that, so the unit needs to stop. Uh, the acclimatization rules penalize it by two. Uh, yeah, they're basically penalized by two as they move into the Mediterranean front, which is a bummer, um, but that's all we can do. And then I still have two more Supreme moves. And I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move this unit. Uh, did I did I decide to build up my, oh, I did not. I did not build up that beachhead, didn't I? But we're gonna go ahead and move this unit down there in the south. Uh, so that's one Supreme move, okay, nice. And then I still have one more supreme move that I could move. I'm not sure exactly which unit I would want to move, quite frankly. Yeah, I'm not sure which unit I would want to move. If there was any other movement unit I would want to move, it's kind of hard to say which one that would be. I mean, they're all pretty much the same. Um, yeah, I think, I think we're just going to leave it at that. And then, um, yeah, we'll just leave it at that. Uh, maybe, you know what, maybe I can pull out, a one of these units. Maybe I can put him in, in, in Plymouth, perhaps. Since it is an expeditionary unit, I kind of want it to be primed and ready to move over to, uh, North Africa whenever possible. But we'll go ahead and deactivate this HQ and I'm actually gonna move it over here to uh, Bristol. So two two Supreme moves that we did over here and then one more. Two rail moves uh, and then two sea supply moves. Um, so that's that. So um, that's gonna conclude our turn. Yep, 
that's going to conclude our turn for the British. Um, now we can move on to the next Fortnite. All right. And so before I do anything, let's do the uh, let's roll the weather for the Mediterranean front. It's going to be clear weather now on the Western front. Interesting. 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 So we're going to flip this and it's going to be clear. And uh, of course, for the Eastern front, we don't have to worry about that because it's already winter. But let's see what the Soviets have in mind for this turn. Um, for the second fortnight, rather. Uh, but I'm excited for this turn. What I plan to do is take Volkov. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to activate the Western HQ. And if you were able to predict this in advance, I was going to blitz a second time. And this time we're going to attack Volkov with even more ground units. And so the plan of action is to go all out here in the sector. And so that's what I intend to do. So I'm, what I'm going to do is we're going to um, move the second shock army into Volkov. I'll pull out the 52nd uh, infantry. I'll pull them out. I'll pull them out, and um, I can only I can only leave three units stacked up. So this is as strong as as it's going to get for our formations. Um, and then I could probably just switch around some of these units. I could even try to attack somewhere else along the front. And I'm thinking, I was thinking maybe attack with the 22nd Army. Maybe attack here in the south. I would have combat support. But the idea being that, uh, you know, I got this 22nd Army in reserve. Maybe I can put some pressure on the flanks here. Put a little bit of pressure on the German Army maybe. that's That was kind of the idea I had in mind. Um, then I'll move this cavalry unit further south. We'll do something like that. Yeah. Okay. So pretty interesting setup. Um, you know, I could also, if I really am ambitious, I could even try another counteroffensive, you know, and maybe try attack Dino. So you know what? I'll go ahead and actually cancel that attack. I'm going to move this HQ to the north instead. And I now have another core there that is in, in range. Another, excuse me, Soviet army. Uh, the Soviet formations are structured differently. Uh, but I have another Soviet army that can attack. And maybe we should get this 22nd army to maybe attack Dino and put more pressure and, and deny the Germans from having any reinforcements to, uh, to attack Leningrad, let's say. So that's what we're going to do with the Soviets. Uh, airstrike is going to go on Volkov. Any other battles on this front? I don't think so. Um, I don't want to use Stavka. I want to keep it at full strength, so best to not activate it on this turn. Um, but let's go ahead and uh, do the Battle of Volkov. If you haven't noticed, I've been maybe talking a little bit faster in this in this uh, particular video. And and I, I just found that my last videos were maybe a little too slow. But I also wanted to either spice up this game uh, or just put a little bit more energy into this game. And I also wanted to like not dilly dally too much compared to my other videos, uh, but I, of course I like to talk, I like to analyze. Um, but I figured like let me just try to show you all a little, little bit more action. I think it would be more fun. Um, and I guess the other idea I had in mind was, um, you know, yeah, just play this and then uh, move on to the next best thing of life, pretty much. So, anyways, let's do this here. This battle of Volkov. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and attack. And uh, no more Soviet movements. Um, I don't really feel compelled to shift around any other units. The only other unit I'm going to move is this Soviet unit over here. I'm actually going to move it, uh, put it on a rail. Um, and, and that's the only other move I'm going to do. Okay, so let's, let's start the battle, Battle of Volkov. Soviets are counterattacking yet again. I really hope we can take it once and for all. What we're going to do is start the airstrike. Only single fire, but they score two hits. Nice. I feel very confident now that we can take Volkov. Germans are going to defend. They don't score any hits. We have a total of nine dice with double fire. Let's see what we can do. Boom. Soviet second shock army scores the double hits that we needed. We just removed, we just destroyed the first German core of the war. We've just taken Volkov. We've opened up the, the rail line for Leningrad. So now Leningrad 
Um, Leningrad was in supplies, right? But now we have the production of Leningrad. Leaving Leningrad, it goes all the way back to Moscow, meaning Soviet production has now been boosted up from 50 to now 56. Okay, and that's a big, big improvement from what we've been dealing with uh, previously, right? So good offensive there for the Soviets. I'm now going to uh, reduce the Western HQ. We still have a blitz turn. Let's take advantage of it. I'm going to move the second shock army now down to Novgorod. And if you guessed it, we're going to concentrate our momentum and just, just shift it to the south and, and put as much pressure as we can on the German army. And then I'll go ahead and move up these uh, some of these other uh, these, these Soviet... Um, yeah, basically move up these uh, Soviet infantry units. Try to get them, uh, ideally, at some point, try to have them reinforce uh, uh, Petrozavodsk and also Soroka, right? Because I want these units to be able to launch an offensive against Murmansk at some point, sooner rather than later. Okay, so that's that. Uh, so we're moving um, a lot of strong units, shock army and tank corps, uh, to Novgorod. And then might as well, you know, try to exploit the situation. I'm going to send these two uh, Soviet armies and put a make an attack on the no. And you can see now we, we, we seem to have like a numerical advantage in the sector, right? Uh, we kind of just dislodged the German defense somewhat. And now, you know, the Germans have one, two, three, four, five, six corps defending, right? Each corps about 50,000 troops, give or take. The Soviets have, let's see, one, two, three, four. Uh, f four armies attacking with another corps in support um, plus two more armies in reserve. Uh, of course, one of them being stationed at Leningrad. And then I guess I guess I have technically a 16th army there as an extra reserve. So Soviets are doing pretty well in the north as far as reserves and, and uh, all that good stuff. So I got to say, yeah, this, the Soviet strategy here seems to have paid off pretty handsomely, if you ask me. Um, and so the, yeah, the overall theme I have right now is to just shift our momentum further south. And the idea I have is to just pin down as many German units as possible. I could also, if I, if I was really ambitious, I could even try to actually attack, um, this sector here. And again, I'm, I'm not going to deal with any river repulse, but I won't have any combat support there. That's the only problem. And I think I'd rather attack with some sort of combat support if I can. Um, so I'm going to put the airstrike there, actually. Um, and then um, as far as any other, you know, uh, course of action or anything I want to do, um, I'm just going to move this infantry unit further south, kind of act as a somewhat of another reserve. Um, we should be doing pretty well. Um, although, actually, I guess I'll just, I'll just leave it where it's at because maybe we can put four units on the no on the next turn if we move these two units there, right? Um, maybe. I also have this other shock army unit. Um, I don't know where to put it. I think I'm gonna move it here. And now it's it's gonna be more easily, I'm gonna have an easier time moving it by rail to reinforce these southern sectors if I can. Um, so yeah, uh, we're gonna attack two hexes now with the Soviets. Both are gonna have combat support. Um, we're going to put the airstrike here at Dano since we have weaker units attacking there. And let's see how much damage we can do. So we'll start here with the, with the Battle of Dano. No uh, river repulses to worry about because the river lines have frozen over. Uh, strong German defense, uh, eight German divisions, uh, four German uh, Panzer Corps. Those are the main defenders. Uh, our airstrike does nothing. Germans roll. Um, the Panzer Corps are a total miss, but the infantry do score one hit. We'll put it on the 22nd Army. We get to roll three dice. We score one hit as well on the German 2nd Corps there. Pretty even exchange. And now this other battle of Nagrod I'm pretty excited about. Germans have eight infantry divisions there versus, uh, I'm not exactly sure how many Soviet divisions, but uh, the last calculation I checked was that each Soviet step basically represents the equivalent of a Soviet rifle corps, which usually on average was about two to three Soviet divisions. So, you know, probably on the order of about 20 Soviet divisions, I would guess, uh, infantry divisions, and, and maybe about, uh, it's hard to say, but I would I'd probably guess the Soviets have 
at least three uh, either tank divisions or tank core. I'm not exactly sure, um, but something of that nature. Soviets, uh, or excuse me, the Axis are going to roll their defense. They score one hit against the Soviet shock army, the strongest unit. We get uh, nine dice, three of which are single fire, the other six are uh, double fire. We'll start with the double fire, of course. Score one hit there, and then the single fire doesn't score anything. So we scored no hits on this turn. That's a bummer. But the good news is that we have saved Leningrad, and that's really good. Um, we've reestablished the supply lines of Leningrad. So that's really cool to see. Um, so the Soviets are still in the fight. Um, the war on the Eastern Front is far from over. And we've at least been able to achieve at least some Soviet winter victory. We've been able to achieve a couple. I mean, uh, a little bit of progress here wasn't, wasn't great. But over here, I think it was much more substantial. And we even destroyed a German unit. So that's good. Um, so that's it. That's going to be the Soviet turn. We'll switch over now to the Axis. Axis. Axis, Axis. Um, I'm going to now hide the German units that are defending, right? These German units should also be hidden. And, um, oh, I actually, I just realized um, I forgot to do the supply check for the, uh, the Axis units on the British turn, right? We forgot to do the supply check of these units. And technically, these units have no supplies, right? Hold on, so let me see here. Um, this unit would be out of supplies, and so would this unit. So I forgot to do them the last turn. So now if I go back to the Axis, the Axis turn, technically that was from the first Fortnite, the supply check. Um, but now since we're in the second Fortnite, uh, or you know just transferring over to the next, next round of combat, this unit is gonna be eliminated back to the force pool, while this unit will be reduced by one. Okay. Um, it's still out of supplies though. Okay. And um, that's that. Uh, so the Axis now get to do some moves. Um, I don't think I'm going to activate the Africa Core. Or, or, or yeah, I don't think I'm going to activate this HQ. Although I could, I think I'm going to pass and, and give it more turns to build up its production, right? Um, I think these other units, um, because the British are going to be out of supplies by the end of this turn, I think we're going to be a fine for any future operations. But we did lose the uh, Italian 10th Army, which was a quite a pricey loss. Um, so that's that. Um, any other moves that the Axis want to do? Nothing on the Western Front. Uh, pretty uneventful on the Western Front. Um, but I guess what I'll do is go ahead and I can activate OK. And go ahead and activate OKH if I really want to. Um, but I'm not really sure what the game plan would even be if I decide to activate OKH, right? I mean... I'd rather just try to be as cost effective as I can with the Germans, especially during the winter, and focus my production on rebuilding the Soviet army, or the, excuse me, the German army, um, rather than spending my money on uh, on all these HQ productions, right? So I'm going to pass for the Axis on the winter, um, and we won't do anything for the Axis on this turn. I mean, yes, the Soviets are attacking, um, but I've... I feel somewhat confident. Maybe we should try to reinforce this area here, come to think of it. Um, hmm. That would actually might be the better the better uh, move. You know what? I am going to go ahead and activate OKH. And I'm going to go ahead and move this guy rear rail. So that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Now it's in range of Leningrad. I'll go ahead and reinforce this unit to Dano. And then, oh, you know what? I can't bring up any more reinforcements there either. You know what? Dang it. No, I'm actually just going to go ahead and I'm not, I'm not going to activate. Uh, I'm not going to activate uh, our OKH. We're just going to pass, pass the German turn there. Um, we won't do anything on the Western Front. Nothing to worry about on the Western Front, of course. Nothing, nothing to see there. Uh, on the Western Front. So now uh, we do the supply check for the uh, the Axis supply uh, check, which you are obviously always checking the enemy supplies. So this British unit's gonna be out of supplies. So we'll switch over to the British side and allow the British forces to remove that unit. 
So British lost another troop. They surrender pretty much. Um, but now there's one more move I want to do with the British. And um, I'm going to go ahead and do it. Uh, you know what? Oh, fudge. I think... Um, oh, man, I really wanted... Uh, this is a clear weather turn, right? Yeah, it is. I wanted to attack Traborg on this turn. I really did. You know, and we have double fire. But the problem is that we won't have any air support. That's the only... That's the only downside that we have right now. But you know what? F it. We're going to go ahead and do it. British are not going to wait any longer. Uh, this is a really good opportunity to attack with the British. We're going to blitz uh, with, this, with this marker, and we're also going to make it an amphibious invasion. So, man, this turn I'm showing you all a bunch of new moves, right? Uh, some North African rules and also some uh, amphibious invasion rules. And I'll show you how it works. Basically, you, you declare that the HQ becomes an invasion HQ. Um, all of your moves are now going to be concentrated for amphibious invasions. This HQ loses all of its uh, command range. It doesn't have command range um, across land. Instead, the command range is focused across sea. So that's one thing. The next thing to do is to indicate where you want to invade. And you can actually invade more than one site uh, with a Blitz HQ. I could either launch um, a two-wave assault, or I could launch two assaults, right? And and that's what that rule book talks about when you uh, when you read up on the uh, the sea invasions and the invasion command. It talks about combat support as well. Uh, it talks about the sea assaults. Um, but yeah, when you do a blitz invasion, you can either do a two-wave invasion. Or you can even do a long-range invasion as well. So if I wanted to invade. Um, an area that is two hexes away, uh, two two basins away. So in the English Channel is one basin. The Bay of Biscay would be the other basin. I could do that as well. So you, you actually have a lot of flexibility there, um, but but it's pretty common sense. You basically have three options. You can either double stack one area, right? Send, you can only send one unit at a time, by the way, when you're doing this amphibious invasion. So I could send two units to Cherbourg, or I could uh, send one unit to Cherbourg, maybe another unit to St. Lo, and try to and circle the uh, the axis there. The third option would be to um, the third option would be to uh, what you call it um, send a long range invasion. And the other thing to point out, and, and it's not very really relevant for this year of the of the conflict, but in the future games, when the Allies do eventually gain um, uh, naval supremacy. Um, all the effects that I just talked about are, are doubled even more, or at least the range is doubled. So in theory, the British could launch a, an invasion site that is four basins away. So they, they just have incredible naval abilities. But for now, we're going to focus on Traborg, simple target. I'll go ahead and send the first British Corps. And I think I'm pretty sure you're supposed to indicate in advance if you're going to launch another target somewhere else. Or if you want to just attack one place with a double stack, and I'm gonna I'm gonna put the blitz marker on Traborg to indicate that I'm gonna double stack Traborg. That's my intention there. All right, so that's that. Um, I can't command any other units. The other thing to point out too, when you're doing an amphibious invasion, is that you only get to command the units that are in the same port as the invasion HQ. So all the units that this invasion HQ are commanding are only the units in Portsmouth. I can't command any other units anywhere else, right? Um, I can only command the units in Portsmouth. So that's something to keep in mind when you're kind of prepping your units up for amphibious invasions. You want to make sure that the HQ and the attacking units are located in the same hex before you launch your attack. So anyways, that's that. We're going to have uh, air, an airstrike here. We are in command range. Um, and so now... Um, yeah, that's that. Uh, so let's go ahead and do this battle for the British. We're attacking with one unit. Let's see what the Germans have. They have this fortress unit, the 25th, I guess is the 25th German Corps or fortress unit. I'm not sure what to call it. Let's see what it can do. Uh, they have triple defense. Keep that in mind. So it's going to be a hard cookie to crack, right? Anyways, we scored one hit there. Um, but the Germans still have two more hits before we neutralize them. So that's why we're blitzing. 
Germans get to uh, defend. They get uh, triple defense, so they do score a hit against the British. So that's that. Um, we're going to go ahead and reduce the HQ now by one. And then I'll go ahead and send this 3rd Infantry uh, Corps over to Cherbourg. Let me also just make sure that there's no other moves in North Africa that I want to do for the British. I don't think so. Um, I could try to reinforce to the 13th Army, try to move it over to Alexandria, but I think uh, because we still control Tobruk, it's going to take some time before the Axis are making their way to Alexandria. They're going to have to take Tobruk, right? So not, not much to worry about there against the Axis, um, but we'll go ahead and do that. Uh, airstrike now, a double fire. Um, and I guess, you know, I guess what I was hoping to have, you know, for the, for this attack, I was actually hoping to use this armored unit for that attack, right? And I, and I decided to forego, forego that and instead move it to North Africa, given how he had the recent defeat there. So that's a bummer, because I know, I know that this, uh, the, the British armored unit would have really increased our odds of success here. Still, we still have to score two more hits. Or I'm actually, no, I'm, I'm excuse me, we're going to have to start all over again, I think. The uh, triple fire applies to each combat round, pretty sure. The, the, the triple defense, excuse me, or the double defense, it applies to each round of combat. So the British are going to have to start all over. So our chances of taking Trebug, uh, Trebug seem pretty limited, if you ask me, but we're going to go for it anyways. Um, so anyways, airstrike, they score one hit. Defenders, no hit. Um, we if we can get two rolls of sixes, we can actually take it. Let's see. Oh my gosh, and they did. They actually did. Excellent. Excellent, excellent, excellent. So this unit is now eliminated. We've just taken Trebourg. And now, because we control the port, we don't have to worry about our supplies for the British units. So that was really cool. Really, really good attack there by the British. Um, and hopefully it's just something to just put a little bit of nuisance, to be a nuisance for the Germans. I mean, of course, the Germans are going to have more advantages here. Right in in uh, in France, they have more units and so on, but it's going to be that much harder for the uh, the Axis to focus on the Eastern Front when they're dealing with uh, British attacks like this in France. So this was a really exciting turn, let me tell you. So um, that's going to be it. I think we finished a British turn. Um, that's the last nation to make turns in this game. Uh, we can now check the supplies for the Axis units. Um, all Axis units are in supplies as far as I can see. Um, they're all in supplies. Uh, even this unit, the Axis uh, supply head, now because the Australian unit over here, the Anzac troops, um, which are which are actually Australian and New Zealand, now that they were eliminated, the Axis uh, rail line moves up to Derna. It is one hex away from um, Bede Hakim, and so this unit here will be in supplies. Um, so that's that. That's going to sum up this uh, this month of combat. Um, to summarize, the Soviets were able to launch uh, finally a successful offensive, uh, relieving the siege of Leningrad temporarily, unless the Germans decide to take it back. We also are seeing the, a lot of action in the Western Front with the landing in Traborg. We saw a devastating Axis offensive in North Africa. The British are now defending in North Africa. We'll see if the Axis decide to push forward. Maybe they'll go and try to take Alexandria, try to take Egypt. There's a lot of options, and strategic options for all the nations right now. Um, but uh, that's another turn. Uh, we're now in 1942. We're in March. Um, the Axis high tide is still relevant. Axis, I think, is still going to have some advantages on the Eastern Front, especially as the summer is approaching. Um, but clearly, they're not, as, uh, they're not as dominant as they were in the previous years of the conflict. Um, now, of course, we started the scenario in summer 1941, but hopefully, you know, we're seeing, um, hopefully we're seeing uh, more combat, more allied offensive operations for, for the rest of the conflict. So um, that's all I have for this video. Thank you so much for tuning in. Hopefully you enjoyed and uh, stay tuned for more as I have good fun playing this. And uh, hopefully, you know, for those of you who are learning this game, you're getting just a better feel for some of the extra rules in the game. Again, highly recommend just reading the rule book, but you know, it is a pain to read in my opinion. So hopefully these videos are just giving you all slightly better insights to the game. 
And if you want to play with me, of course, just, you know, send me a comment below. Uh, I can hook you up on a Discord. And then, uh, yeah, we can definitely play a few games. And maybe I can make some videos of our play sessions. But in the meantime, that's all I got for this video. Thanks for tuning in. I will see you in the next video. Peace out.